Hello, welcome to our lecture on reflective practice. We're going to explore how it's applied by practitioners in the form of psychologists, coaches, helping professionals. Obviously, I'm a sports psychologist, so I'm going to speak from that perspective for the main part. But reflective practice is meant to permeate the entire career of most helping professions. So we're going to look at how it's used and how it can help us not only to improve our practice, but also to improve the reporting of our practice so that we can, over time, be more accountable and, uh, as I say, actually deliberately improve as we develop as practitioners. We're going to explore a couple of things, really. Whether this thing called reflection or effective practice actually does enhance performance, because there's a lot of people who kind of find it cumbersome and would like to have a proper randomised control trial to prove that it's worthwhile doing. I'm not sure that exists yet, but it would be good if it were to come about. We have reflection versus reflective practice, and they're slightly different, and we'll explore each of those two things. And then we'll start to explore how that can help us to become a better practitioner, and also, um, for the students watching, to gain better marks in assignments, because obviously that's important. And let's not forget those assignments are meant to reflect what will uh, help you in real life afterwards. So um, this is something which will in my opinion, help you in real life, but also can be used quite explicitly to make sure you're picking up marks in assignments. We want to define what these things are, um, look at any relationship between reflection and reflective practice, look at the um, attributes, the components of reflection and reflective practice, uh, and just start to see how it might be done and what the barriers might be to it. Um, all the time, with a mind just to say how can I report on reflective practice because uh, one of the observations people make is that uh, they feel that they are a reflective person and they feel like they do analyze but actually reporting that for someone else a supervisor an assessor whatever it might be is much harder so we're going to look at ways of actually bringing that to the surface and making it reportable making it accountable so um, when it was starting to become recognised in sports psychology in the sort of early 2000s. We had some good writing happen, and you'll see our key reading also addresses this. As the field of sports psychology continues to evolve, attention is shifting from what techniques work uh, to a focus on the processes and factors that influence the effectiveness or ineffectiveness of delivery. And actually, I think that's still happening, and to a large extent, many degree courses still focus on what do we do with clients in terms of the techniques we might offer them, but those techniques can be rendered relatively uh, useless if there's a breakdown in the relationship, breakdown in communication, breakdown in the motivation to actually go and do those uh, techniques or make those life changes. So reflective practice is um, a way of looking back at yourself as the main instrument of change and looking at ways that you could be more um, effective. So uh, a different way of writing a similar sort of stuff, you've got Podolkowski et al. Emphasise the importance of managing yourself as the main instrument of, of uh, in your practice or instrument of change. And they argue that by paying attention to yourself, uh, thoughtfully analysing your consultations or service delivery, and being aware of limitations, your own kind of biases and conflicts and self-interest, prejudices even, even frustrations, practitioners are in a better position to actually manage themselves and become a better um, instrument of change, effectively. And one of the things that I reflect on quite often is that by being reflective, you move the um, noticing of potential problems from after the event to in the moment. So uh, that's an important transition to make so that you can actually prevent uh, difficulties, awkward moments from ever occurring. Um, and if any of you are ever lucky enough to see me kind of uh, in a consultation or in practice, there are moments where I'm kind of both listening and um, contemplating something important and you can sort of tell that I'm trying to do a lot of stuff in my head at once. And that's because uh, I'm often noticing there could be an important point coming up or an important uh, question to ask, uh, perhaps a tension between uh, two different states of of mind or different points of view and actually identifying those and being able to uh, navigate them is a key skill of a psychologist and it's not something you're 
born with. It's not something you only learn by osmosis. You need to be out there practicing, but also analyzing that practice. And if you can bring forward that noticing and analyzing into the moment, so it's not happening afterwards, that to me is the power of developing a, what I call a reflective engine, something which is capable of doing that quickly and efficiently without stopping you from being in the moment. So the idea is there are two types of learners. Um, of course, um, if you've ever spoken to me, you'll hear that I'm quite um, hesitant around learning theories that classify people into types. But it might be that there are types of learning, for example, so information, uh, that, and this is how often we enter university, looking for facts and patterns and things that we can memorize and simply regurgitate. And they're quite mechanical and a lot of knowledge in the world especially the sort of trivial uh, pursuit type questions are things you can memorize, regurgitate, no problem. But there's also this um, type of learning or knowledge where you learn processes and understanding and meaning and how meaning is constructed in moments or by people. And there's an awful lot of um, discrepancies and difficulties and contradictions in that, but that is how people are. And uh, often you could argue that seeking um, the sort of hard facts that are memorized and stable over time is to misconstrue what psychology is. So there's a kind of attempt to be able to navigate through uncertain territory, uncertain ground, which I think is what university tries to teach you about higher learning. And that would be our sort of second type of uh, learning. And you can see that in the way that I teach when I ask people to actually reflect back on their progress um, with key concepts and through each unit, I'm asking them to actually track their understanding of difficult, unfamiliar uh, topics that won't offer many um, hard, simple, memorable facts. And um, even sometimes the way you interpret those seemingly hard facts can change um, and make the, the story look quite different. And you'll see that sometimes when people come at the same topic from different perspectives. They might even cite the same studies, same findings, but from a different uh, angle. So psychology is complex. There's very little hard ground to stand on. And the trick is to be able to navigate within that. Um, the second you start looking for the hard facts, you normally um, setting yourself up to fail. So oftentimes research shows that that deep learning is more be sorry, better served by reflective practice. Um, so whereas rote learning, repetition, helps us to learn facts. Uh, actually going back and analyzing and trying to bring to from implicit to explicit, trying to explicate key decisions and key thoughts is a vital aspect uh, in, in being better able to navigate difficult, uncertain territory. So first of all, what is reflection? It's just simply a thought process, and I think to a large extent, most people have some uh, tendency to reflect and stop and think back about what happened. It's probably a sad state in life when you never need to stop and think, did I do the right thing there? What happened? Why did that happen? Etc. Um, so it might be looking back at what's happened retrospectively or trying to contemplate what will happen prospectively. Um, and there's different types as well, so there's even the kind of in-the-moment reflection that I've been alluding to, which uh, shown called in vivo reflection. And that's kind of the ability to step back and analyse while still being in the moment, and perhaps not uh, losing that involvement in the moment, but also having some awareness of uh, where you're up to. And I often, you know, that uses the reference here to the artistry of professional practice, but I often say, actually, if we could consistently explicate this and have a language and have frameworks and theories for good practice and people were able to share those conversations and those thoughts, I suspect it would stop looking like magical, artistic, you know, who knows how to explain that. And it would start to look a lot more like a sort of scientific process. Uh, it's just that we are not yet armed with the right vocabulary and frameworks and theories to really talk about these key moments in the service delivery effectively. 
So it does look like uh, magic, and there's that kind of famous quote, any sufficiently advanced technology would appear to the uneducated as magic. And that's probably a good explanation of, of what happens in here, I think. It could be something you do to self-assess and to try and judge your own competence, which is often a key part of um, assessments or registration protocols where you try and show some awareness that you know you're maybe not there yet, but quite good. And it's often a mistake, therefore, when people say, of course, they're a brilliant 10 out of 10 for everything, because it's a clear sign they haven't really reflected properly. It's a good way of identifying your own progress in learning and your own kind of next most useful things to learn um, and therefore your own development needs and that's why reflective practice is often um, positioned as, as vital to uh, CPD or uh, continuing professional development. So once school and university and even supervised practice have run out you're really left with mentoring and reflection and reflective practice as your main instruments and the textbooks may not help and there's plenty of information out there but actually the main thing you'll be doing is working, getting experience, reflecting on that experience. If you're lucky, you'll have a good mentor who you can share some ideas with. But the one thing you've almost definitely got, because it's kind of unavoidable, is some reflection and reflective practice. And making the best use of that to make sure you continue to develop is both ob obviously good for you, but it's also an ethical requirement of most regulators, uh, especially in psychology. So then we get into, okay, what is this thing? Uh, it, it's, reflection brings to mind the idea of just a mirror which you look into. And it's certainly an attempt to divert attention back inwards, look at your own actions, behaviours, feelings, capacities, competencies, and actually analyse how they fit into a situation that may have happened or a situation that is approaching. So it might be that uh, retrospective reflection, you can't change, you're simply looking back at um, a description, like a photograph, that's what happened, that's how it is or was, um, and we can still glean understanding from that, but there's perhaps more power in actually being able to plan what should I expect, um, could I project myself into that situation, can I plan for key signals, key warning signs maybe that I should perhaps be changing tact, and it puts you in a much stronger position, it's perhaps more useful to become able to reflect, first of all, and that will usually be based on retrospective reflection. But then as you get good at it, to be able to project forwards, and of course to use it in the moment. So it's helping us to become, to learn, and it's also helping us to, um, to plan for situations we may not even have experienced before. So when I'm talking about this, um, in my better moments, I think I have this little passage in, in the book, I talked about the builder architect, so someone who is building, a, let's say a building, you know, a house, and they want it to be as good and awesome as possible, and uh, you know, it can do all sorts of things, and everyone who goes to that house is going to love it. And it's good in the winter, good in the summer, whatever happens, that house is going to be great. They, all, they have maybe a plan in mind, but it's taking time and the materials available, um, you know, which I'm equating to the latest theories and knowledge, they often change. Sometimes you're, you have to incorporate new materials. And what you want is someone who can step back from the act of building, i.e. building themselves as a practitioner or metaphorically building this house. Step back, take a look at where they're up to, what they planned, what's available, how things are going, and they're actually able to change the plans and change the, the way the house is growing and building to make it better. And it's something which may never end. Let's just say it's an ongoing process. So you're building your own capacity and propensity and skills to become an awesome, most maximally capable practitioner. And I'd probably argue not just good at one thing or one style, but actually able to adapt to whatever group is put in front of you. So you, you have this idea of someone who's both doing and also stepping back and analysing and with the plans and able to change the plans. 
And that to me is a nice metaphor for what you're doing with reflecting. You're building something, but you step back, check, you view what you've got, you view your plans, and you change and adapt accordingly. So if we just focus on trying to define reflection before we define reflective practice, reflection might be uh, an activity in which people recapture um, their experience, think about it, mull over it. And I think most of us do that in some capacity. And then we're just talking about formalizing it and recording it. And you might say, okay, through reflection, analysis, we strive to understand the experience. And that's at the very heart of, of human psychology. We strive to be able to um, know that we can influence the world uh, in important ways and we can achieve the outcomes we want uh, in our little environment. And to do that, we analyse experiences. It's uh, fairly sort of most theories of motivation and of uh, sort of even overall theories of human psychology and experience tend to say we want to be able to understand the world. And if you take away someone's ability to really meaningfully understand the world and everything is confusing and doesn't make sense and there's no pattern and they can't perceive the pattern, they become quite unhappy uh, quite quickly. And that's often um, part of the experience of different types of mental illness. So you've got this idea of what is reflection and it's not that it's a particularly um, singular uh, definition. There'll be different approaches in different textbooks, but you might get thoughtful deliberation, uh, learning from experience, simple as that, systematic, critical and creative thinking about action uh, with the intention of understanding its roots and processes. That sounds very much aligned to how I probably talk about it. It's something which we all do informally and implicitly because it's part of being alive, part of being a human. But if we're trying to use it deliberately and on purpose to inform our practice and improve our practice, that bottom definition probably fits better. And of course it comes with this uh, state of doubt and hesitancy and just recognising that you're not completely sure what you're doing. And that's often in any situation what triggers us to start thinking harder. And it's what you want to avoid normally in uh, athletes when they're performing. You don't want to switch on that uh, reflective mode when they're in the middle of performing. And if you do, you can normally instigate some kind of choke or drop in performance because it's not normally a part of uh, athletic performance. So it's often equated to if we can make someone doubt themselves and they start thinking more, then we've, we can usually we can make them play worse. However, when you can step back from these key moments, analyse and understand there, that's useful. And of course, even athletes would want to step back, analyse their performance, uh, look at key decisions they made and after the event. It's just that if you're doing it in the event, a lot of athletes will, and sports psychologists will be saying that's best avoided which complicates the idea of um, in vivo reflection slightly because certainly practitioners are encouraged to be able to notice problems in the moment. And it might be that there are even moments within sporting performances where it is appropriate to pause and analyze. But quite commonly, we can, um, we can infer that someone is uh, thinking too much if their performance drops off and you can normally trace that back to some kind of self-doubt in sporting performance. It's a bit, um, a bit more controversial there because you haven't got time. That's one of the few things. You're, you are time deprived in many sports, whereas in working with a client and athlete, you do deliberately often try and slow the whole process down and take a beat just to recapture your thoughts, recapture your um, train of thought, I guess. So if that then leads to learning and change, then we can say that um, We've got good reflection, good branching into reflective practice because it's generating changes. Reflective practice is applying the skill of reflection to our own practice. Reflection kind of happens anyway. Reflective practice is where it's specific to a, a practice like psychologist, like coach, any helping profession. With the deliberate intention of improving professional practice. Therefore, you've got self-assessment in there, so you're evaluating your own competence, 
you've got um, identifying key learning points and key critical moments and how you might recognize them and what skills you might need in future to respond better. You've got thinking about how you might actually acquire that learning and what needs to happen for you to gain those skills to be more competent. And you've got actually making deliberate changes to your practice um, as a result. So, reflective practice is reflection deliberately applied to practice with the intention of improving it. Uh, it has an active concern with the aims and consequences of what you are doing as a practitioner. Um, which again means you should be aware of um, the aims at all times, what it is that I'm trying to do as a practitioner, um, which is again often open to debate, depends on who the client is, what context you're working in. Um, it's both in mo well, most textbooks and certainly in the book that I wrote, I talk about it as a kind of spiralling process whereby you, you work through these processes iteratively uh, and it might be that you end up sometimes spending longer um, describing something and sometimes you spend more time analysing but there's just generally this process whereby you accumulate knowledge by um, iteratively cycling through this reflective process. Um, it requires a deliberate, open recognition that you are not complete, not perfect. And actually when you see practitioners trying to claim, of course I'm complete and perfect, I've got the right qualification, that's often where reflection and reflective practice falls away and often that's where they're open to making mistakes. So you really need to recognise from the outset, I'll always be improving, I'll always be looking for not just some new idea, but actually becoming more capable. Not just some new theory, some new technique, but actually uh, are able to serve a wider range of clients in more contexts with more aims and needs. Uh, that probably is the, the embodiment of what you're trying to achieve through effective practice. Again, it's based on this idea of professional judgment. So there is a, a subjective element, but if you're able to kind of explicate that, explain it, uh, and become accountable for those judgments, not just, um, again, leave it to craft and art and magic, uh, it often makes it better to, to share for mentoring purposes, reporting processes, and to actually, if you do record these things, which most people argue you should, you can come back afterwards, long after the event, and actually analyze. That's what I was thinking then. I think differently about that now. So reflective practice, therefore, is enhanced through collaboration and dialogue with colleagues because they'll have different perspectives, um, different terminology, language, different uh, theories even perhaps to apply, and their own experiences to share. So it might give you much more um, sort of scope, more ideas to draw from rather than just your own experience. So we can define reflective practice as a model, I'm sorry, a mode that links thought and action through reflection. It involves critically analysing one's actions with the goal of improving one's practice. So there's a little bit of a difference between simply reflecting, perhaps without a deliberate purpose in mind, and reflecting for the explicit purpose of improving your practice. Therefore, it becomes this kind of dialogue whereby uh, I think about what I did in order to try and do better next time. Reflection is therefore part of that, and they're not that different, but we're almost um, taking on or hijacking the unavoidable act of reflection and making sure it actually is deliberately enhancing practice, and that therefore becomes reflective practice. Um, I've definitely made that point, I think, that the aim is to improve practice. Um, I guess reflection might allow us just to mull and think without always coming back to practice, it might be some other life lesson we're trying to extract, or it may simply be um, something fun when there's nothing good on TV, just to mull over things. However, if it becomes something you're deliberately working on your own practice, then we have reflective practice. And here we're talking about that act of being able to resolve uncertainty. Um, so on the one hand, I think it's important to simply accept uncertainty as part of the job but 
it's easy to accept when you know that you actually have something to fight back with, some chance of one day resolving uncertainty because you're constantly analysing, constantly learning and improving. So in a very simplistic sense, if you look at where you're going uh, and look at where you are and then where you've been, it may be you can identify patterns, trends, um, even just attributes and properties of situations that gradually enable us and this is kind of the idea of you know experience and wisdom accumulating and for it's perfectly possible to to gain and improve without doing this deliberately but the nature of the job and the ethical requirements require us to be doing this on purpose and so we just take something which could be left to chance could be left to accident and we do it on purpose and we do it with the idea of making sure we're getting better as a psychologist. So the identified benefits, which some have been sort of picked out in this research, some are simply still um, assertions that this theoretically makes sense. It should, by the way it's designed really, improve the quality of our performance as a practitioner and improve our practice. It should allow us to be slightly more objective in evaluating our practice because you would be amazed how many uh, case studies from quite advanced practitioners simply say, I feel it went well, I feel I'm a good psychologist, which isn't really the level of accountability we need. Uh, you know, you can't really uh, audit someone's feelings, but if they can put it into words slightly more objectively and say, well, based on these criteria, um, they, these goals were met, these other things might not have been quite as I intended. It's much more open and accountable and therefore the lessons for the future are easier to extract. Um, just simply saying, I feel it went well, short circuits all of that and it doesn't demonstrate the critical thinking, reflective practice that university assignments require um, and usually that we expect of someone doing a you know, difficult job like practicing sports psychology. It also helps us to identify our strengths and so it may be that we're better able to um, sell our service for example um, and know when to apply those skills. So it's not all about looking for what's wrong. It should by giving us this um, better understanding of how we work and, and what uh, might be our weaknesses for example and giving us a better vocabulary, it, it should improve our professional judgement our ability and that's sometimes uh, also called contextual intelligence, where you're walking into these situations and you don't always know what to look for. And so sometimes you walk into a new team, new club, and with a good experience, you may have more chance of knowing what to do. But if you've actually explicitly analysed all your previous experiences and you know typical, um, reliable signs of how things work in a club, that may actually be much more useful information. So your professional judgement in key moments, when you're brand new or when some uh, problem occurs, you may actually make better decisions, you have a better gut basically. And that's one of the key things I return to quite often is that by doing this deliberately you actually improve your heuristics and your rules, rules of thumb so that you, without always knowing it, make better decisions and that's been earned because you analysed how you operated in the past. Of course we learn from mistakes and successes um, which is not a given. Again, it can't just be left to chance that that's going to happen. Uh, and of course, therefore, we can plan for the future um, and actually identify, I know now that if I see these circumstances, I should change tactic. Or in these circumstances, what I used to do doesn't work. And that, of course, is extremely valuable information. Generally speaking, we are constantly reflecting, uh, just on the drive home, uh, sometimes just talking about what happened with a friend. Uh, it's often just something unavoidable, but to do it on purpose with the intention of improving your practice, that's reflective practice. So, with then talking about kind of hijacking that, pr that process, which is happening anyway, and capturing it for recording purposes and analysing it to make it reflective practice. So you might simply um, try and extract from the conversation with a friend some deliberate outcome, some lesson, rather than simply describing, you could push for understanding of why something happened and some actions you could take 
to recognise it better, to prevent it from happening in future. Um, the same for just sort of idle thinking when you're driving and you haven't got anything else to do. It could just be that you um, make a mental note to when you get home, just jot something down. I'll, I'll make sure that I extract a learning from this reflection that I was, again, unavoidably doing. And if it's leading to key things to explore, key lessons, key things to change, then the chances are it's going to prove useful. Uh, the way it's typically done, and I'll show you some reflective cycles in a minute, is to use some sort of template, and that does involve writing things down. And that's where people often trip up because it's viewed as being quite um, tedious. It might be that you have something more kind of every day, like recording into a dictaphone, or um, just keeping a very simple diary. You're supposed to keep records of every single session that you do with a client. So it, what would be wrong with simply having reflections and reflective practice within those? Um, but what we see is the barriers to reflective practice tend to be people think it takes too much time, even though, as I say, record keeping is meant to be part of our practice. And if you didn't have records and someone needed to see them in you know, difficult circumstances, that could be a problem. There is, There remains a preconception that it's just not worth doing um, and maybe textbook learning would have been enough. But I'd probably argue very strongly, sort of 10 years into my career or so, that I think reflective practice is extremely important because when all the support is kicked away and all you're left with is just you, maybe a mentor, not a supervisor because you've finished supervision, this is all you're left with. And I think it is extremely important to keep um, improving error detecting and becoming more capable. Sometimes organisations uh, prescribe that there is a correct way of doing things and so why bother reflecting? Uh, sometimes people don't want to be um, the possibility even of someone reflecting and noticing a problem. They want to have a correct way of doing it, you do it our way and that's how we do things here. Which completely undermines reflective practice and takes away the opportunity to improve really, apart from unless they have their own annual review or whatever of that process. So sometimes the very organisation can undermine reflective practice. Sometimes people simply aren't honest with themselves because you feel like after many years of university, a couple of years of training, you must be good, in, good enough. Uh, but actually what that good enough means, what that um, certificate means is that you're sort of judged competent to practice on your own without too much risk, but you still need to keep improving. And if anyone kind of stops trying to improve, the chances are, in an ever-changing and evolving world, that they will eventually um, tip over into incompetent, having been adequate for a long time. So we need to um, recognise, as a first assumption, that we're never going to be perfect, never actually going to be um, good enough in a way that is certain forever. Um, there's a sometimes an element of fear that we may identify something we don't want to think about and it's kind of difficult to grapple with. We don't want to think of ourselves as being flawed, but actually again, vitally important, every client we work with is you know, being asked to recognise they might have some gap between how good they want to be and how good they are. We should probably be open to the same um, thought and it shouldn't be something to really fear. And then there's an element of people arguing that reflective practice is unscientific because you know it's not something where you have a validated objective measure which you can simply apply. And you know everyone would score the same regardless. But we're actually operating in a zone uh, where you wouldn't really expect everyone to have the same skills and attributes. And you know we've got practitioners all around the world in different cultures, in different environments, different teams. We wouldn't expect objective, valid reliability between those and uh, it might be that in time we're able to gradually tease out key uh, attributes and key um, competencies but it's also for now important just to be able to give people something with which they can effectively study their own practice and if we all studied our own practice and all reported on that and shared it and then 
analyse those reflections and lessons, the chances are we'd build up a body of knowledge that would allow us to improve all of sports psychology, perhaps even all of psychology practice. There's something really, really valuable in that, and I've pushed that in various channels in the book, and I started, tried to start a new journal once. I think it's extremely important that we actually recognise that science does offer us um, interesting, useful tools to improve the practice of psychology. Those tools don't have to be all about objectivity, reliability, validity, because we don't yet know what we should be measuring or um, you know we haven't really got a vocabulary or good theories with which to, to analyze this stuff. In time I would like to believe that we can explicate, analyze and generate a shared understanding of what good practice looks like. It doesn't have to be something where it's um, a magic or art or craft or be um, something which people hide and keep secret because it's valuable to, for making their money kind of thing. I don't think that's the spirit of science particularly, or the spirit of you know the, our profession. So when you are doing this, one of the classic uh, angles, rather than simply looking at everything that happened, is to tease out critical incidents, the key moments. Some of those will be obvious, they'll be quite jarring, some will only reveal themselves when you're looking back and thinking, oh, I could have done that differently. Now I realise I could have asked a different question, taken a different tact. Uh, so they're critical incidents and they're the bits that are really worth analysing. We wouldn't simply, you know, every small bit of conversation want to analyse those um, because there we end up in analysis paralysis, which I guess is another... Um, barrier to reflective practice. If you spend too much time analysing and not doing, you aren't delivering a service. So another one for that list would have been analysis paralysis. We, When you have those events, you can normally use them to extract lessons and it could be that it went really well, unexpectedly well. It could be that something went wrong or felt a little bit out of place or looking back afterwards you're saying what uh, maybe at the end of a relationship, it didn't go as planned, and you're looking back saying, yes, I could have done that differently. I made a wrong assumption there. And we need to recognise that if we're ever to improve our practice. One of the most sort of popular, I think usable models is Gibbs cycle. And you start off by simply describing what happened. And I like to try and focus people on describing one element, so not the whole thing, one important element, and this applies to the way I teach, the way I work with uh, training psychologists, tease out something critical, a critical incident, critical element. Describe that, and you, maybe you've only got a hundred words or so. If, you know, it doesn't need to be a lot. Then we try and transition into, okay, my initial reaction, my thoughts and feelings around that moment, that thing. Then we start to try and push into not just initial thoughts and feelings, but actually uh, be slightly more objective and evaluate by which we mean, can we tease out good or bad, which bits were good or bad, how good or bad. So we're trying to give kind of a, an appraisal of, uh, a balanced appraisal of in, in what ways was this thing good or bad. That leads us into asking why was this thing good or bad? How did that happen? And that's the analysis section. And each of these could be 100, 150 words, um, and if you've got an awful lot going on, I would recommend having more of these cycles, not really, really, really big passages of text. From the analysis, you should be able to tease out some key things which you could be changing, focusing on, learning, and that transitioned into an action plan of what you must do next, what you should learn, change, um, think about, research, so that you're then feeding into the next cycle. Okay, now I've got this new understanding, new knowledge, new capability, what's now happening? So it's explicitly designed as an iterative cyclical process. So these are some examples from my own case studies in 2007, I think, when I was finishing off my applied practice and I had a meeting of players who had been injured and um, it was quite intimidating, so I kind of felt out of my place doing what eventually turned into a kind of group psychology session, and that's not something I'd really done 
It reminded me of um, Alcoholics Anonymous, the way we were all just sharing and pouring our hearts out in this room. But it offered the guys this chance to, evaluation-wise, something they'd never been given the chance to do, and some really important shared lessons came out of that. So they felt reassured that other guys felt the same way, and I was able to sort of say, with your permission, can I feed this back into the management? And in the end, uh, it was something which allowed us to instigate a couple of really good initiatives in the club. So that, for example, the players um, could come together when they were injured and travel to matches to still watch and still be involved, which you know isn't always typical. And those players might be able to have socials together or go to the rehab in the gym together just so they weren't isolated when they were out for long periods of time. So it, in the end, led to a really good response and a really good support service. All of that writing there goes in the back and doesn't count towards my word count. And all that appears in my reporting was maybe just 40 words, 30 words there. And this is why you can use reflective practice not only to improve your practice, but to improve the way you write and to make sure you're picking up marks and assignments because you can bring to the surface and explicate um, important decisions that otherwise were just made in the background and no one can understand or explore. And as a reader, that can be infuriating. You'll just turn the page going, where did that come from? Where's this big decision been made? If you can capture it in a reflective cycle, for example, then actually you don't need much in the text. And yet the reader can flip to the back and say, yes, I see why you did that. And there's no angst or doubt or magic, it's very clear why it was done. Even if the reader disagrees with what was done, at least they can see it and it's clear. It would take quite a small-minded reader to read that and say, well, I disagree, I don't like that, I'm taking marks off. More often the marks are lost because no attempt was made to explain something really important. Likewise, a uh, different uh, session full reflective cycle, lots of detail, and then all we ended up with in the text was a line and a half, maybe two lines if you add it all up. So really important, um, really useful tool, I think, for improving practice, improving the whole profession, but for most of us the next thing we're going to be doing is writing an assignment or a case study or um, an end of training summary of our practice and that's where reflections and effective cycles can be so useful. Capture them, use them, accumulate them over time, and then you can return to them when you're writing. And the key decision you made that may have just been lost in the background, you can actually explain to a reader without burning your word count. So, if you only have a certain number of words, you have to, in my opinion, be able to explain vital decisions um, and for example, demonstrate that you can be critical not only about theories and research, but critical about your own practice, then you need to somehow demonstrate that you can do that. And these cycles, whether it be Gibbs or Johns or another model, they allow you to demonstrate that you've analysed, identified weaknesses and hopefully acted on those uh, you know, lessons learned. So you get better, you get better understanding and you can demonstrate to someone, some stranger, that you've actually recognised that and acted on it, which is extremely powerful. So that's why I get quite passionate about reflective practice. The key reading I've identified for you is um, Elsa Anderson, Zoe Knowles, David Gilborn. Uh, you've also got some good uh, re references here. Brendan Cropley is very good uh, across the board, really, lots of good papers. But the one that I'm going to make you read is uh, Anderson et al. And I'm hoping that that's really um, made it very clear why it's important, how it's important, and how the decision making that we've been focusing on is improved over time by reflective practice. Um, any questions, you know where to find me. Otherwise, I'll speak to you soon. Bye.